So let's get started. I'm here with a fireside chat with Matteo Pilati from DBS, and I'm Sandeep Uttamchani from Unravel. So first question, welcome, Matthew. Really excited to have you. Um, great if you could um, you know, briefly introduce um, yourself and uh, you know, in terms of your background and your role at DBS. Yep, sure. So as you said, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Matteo Pelati. I'm actually leading the uh, data platform at, uh, at, uh, at uh, DBS. Uh, and uh, I've been with the bank for the last uh, three years. And basically, uh, over the last three years, we have built the enti our entire data platform from, uh, from the ground up, actually. I mean, we started with nothing and then uh, and uh, the team started out from like uh, four or five people and now we are over like 100 people. And um, yeah, so I've been... Uh, uh, I've been working in the field for the last like 20 years, uh, different companies, mostly uh, mostly startup. Uh, then then, then um, that's where my background is from. So this is my actually my 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 first bank. Uh, yeah. So this gives you a, a, a an overview of of, of uh, what I'm doing at, at DBS. That's that's phenomenal, and um, I know DBS has a large. Like, you know, it's, it's one of the key banks uh, in Singapore. Uh, so it's, it's really phenomenal sort of um, building the data platform. Yes, now, we, yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah we, we, we started this journey. DBS is going through all the digitalization. And uh, one thing we're starting to do is, uh, is very much, uh, uh, you know, typically banks, they tend to outsource uh, uh, development. And we started this journey where we, uh, we have much more development, uh, much more development house, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, we we are uh, migrating to uh, open source technologies as well, and uh, we also started to contribute back to open source. So we are going through this entire journey. That's phenomenal, and uh, I've seen some of your other work, Matthew. You're truly truly a thought leader in this space. Um, sort of really. Um, I would say spearheading a whole bunch Thank of- Thank you very much. So these days, um, I know top of mind from you know, where we are, COVID-19 COVID has been uh, really something that each and every enterprise uh, across the world is grappling with, right? And um, maybe a good starting point, uh, Matthew, would be to get your thoughts on you know, how, is, how is the whole COVID situation impacting banks in Singapore? Uh, well, uh, obviously there is an uh, a, a, a economical impact that it's inevitable everywhere in the world. Uh, now the situation is quite, uh, I would say it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, we basically had two waves. Uh, we had the first wave a uh, uh, couple of months back and then things started to get better and now we start having a, a second wave. Uh, definitely there is a big impact on the organizational aspect right? because, you know, uh, banks uh, are traditionally not so, um, not so uh, keen to, to, uh, to have a remote workforce and probably they are one of the industry that is, uh, is lacking most, but uh, all in a sudden uh, we found ourselves having to do that because uh, uh, there were uh, basically uh, order from the government that uh, most of the work should be carried out uh, uh, remotely and unless uh, unless uh, if for some other reason is not possible so you know we found ourselves in this situation and we had to adapt to it and uh, uh, we managed to adapt it pretty well i must say i mean i mean obviously there were some 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 challenges in the beginning because uh, uh, the entire organization was not prepared, even in terms of remote access, in terms of, uh, of uh, scalability of the remote access systems. Uh, but I must say that we are, we, are, uh, we are handling it pretty well, I must say now. That's, that's phenomenal. I think that's, that's definitely good news. Um, also, Matteo, do you have thoughts as to other businesses, so outside the banks in Singapore, um, how are they recovering? 
uh well the you know obviously um i see uh you know in singapore uh we didn't really have a a a, a let's say a, a strict lockdown like other countries uh they uh, they limited social contact they invited people to stay at home uh so obviously there are some businesses that have huge impact like for example singapore airlines all the airlines everything is shut down uh obviously there is an impact but uh, uh to be honest uh, uh i do not see that uh, i mean if i look at not just the businesses but uh, also the entire society i didn't see that uh, level of impact uh, that uh, i've seen in other countries i mean china but i'm talking about some european countries like like italy for example i'm from italy uh, and uh, uh, the uh, the impact that covid had there uh, was was really huge actually uh, i mean like uh, basically all the businesses were shut down uh, it happened here in singapore but i felt it was uh, was uh, uh, milder and handled it more with uh, more carefully uh so so yeah obviously there is an impact but i mean hopefully things will will start to uh, recover soon now this uh, this week is basically uh, we are getting out of the what they call a circuit breaker so things will start to ease and uh, and restriction will start to loosen so hopefully this situation will uh, will will get better soon that is phenomenal absolutely phenomenal Um, yeah, in the U.S., we definitely have COVID, and also more recently, the social unrest, uh, which is yeah. which is a whole new wave uh, to work through. From a DBS standpoint, uh, Matteo, what is top of mind uh, for you? You know, not necessarily just from a COVID standpoint, but also from the broader, you know, planning ahead uh, from the slowdown and the pandemic standpoint. uh planning ahead i must say that uh, that uh, um um talking about the technology mostly because where I'm, that's where i'm 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 mostly involved uh definitely uh uh i i there are already talks uh, uh of of uh, of uh, having remote work uh, uh um as a long term arrangements actually and there are many requests for that and uh, one thing that would definitely help uh, and that's something that we are uh, uh, we are exploring is uh, moving to the cloud currently most of our uh, our systems are uh, are on prem uh, and it has always been traditionally like that there is you know for for banks and 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 companies with uh, with uh, uh with uh, pii data it's very sensitive to move to to the cloud uh but you know the there were uh, a lot of discussions before of moving to the cloud and uh, and uh, i think this uh, covid situation kind of accelerated these discussions and accelerated also uh, the the implementation of uh, uh of cloud adoption for us of course it's a, it's a journey that will take time is it's not going to happen overnight but uh, uh but yeah i think that this this to some extent it helped uh, in in having more uh, discussion on this and having more uh, more use cases and more uh, uh, actual usage and then and we are we are starting right now i mean we are uh, we we are investing a lot in in tokenization of data encryption of data so that all the data can be in the cloud so there is a lot of investment in in, in that direction and and probably that that uh, the speed up was also brought up by by this uh, uh, uh it was not the main the main reason but uh, but one of the uh, contributing factor let's say was also the the covid situation totally makes sense yes yes now in addition to moving to the cloud um, in terms of you know new projects or projects priorities anything you can shed a light on especially in the data space some of the projects that you're prioritizing 
Yeah, so um, we, um, as you know, we are investing a lot in, in data and my, uh, my group is basically, uh, is basically running the data platform itself. So we do not run uh, specific applications, uh, but uh, we run the platform. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes uh, the, uh, like building a platform is very much about uh, uh, putting some pieces together and make them work together. Uh, we, uh, we decided in the beginning to invest a lot in, 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 uh, in building a complete solution. You know? uh, and uh, we started doing a lot of development as well. And uh, so we, we kind of built uh, uh, this platform from the ground up uh, with a lot of components that were built, with a lot of software that we adopted open source and, uh, uh, and building to some extent a full end-to-end -end, uh, self-service portal for, for the user. Uh, this took time, obviously, uh, but uh, uh, the ROI was really high because uh, uh, people, our users, uh, now can very easily ingest data, can very easily build compute jobs, uh, uh, and that's uh, that's I believe the what we get back from from what we invested. And then you know, uh, many times is is uh, is not just uh, just about taking some tools like like for example in, uh, on Revel, but it's also about the full integration. I can give you one example that that where we we leverage on Revel. Uh, so we have uh, uh, compute jobs that uh, that are built by our user, and we have our own tool that allows them to uh, compute jobs to build the compute job directly on the cluster, debug them on the cluster and uh, uh, do the build uh, through a web UI as well. And once they do the build, uh, they can take that artifact and easily promote it to the next environment. So we go to UAT, we go to QA environment, and we go to production environment um, uh, in a fully automated way using our uh, UI of a component that we wrote, which is the artifact lifecycle manager. Now, the key part for us is, for example, our artifact lifecycle manager heavily integrates with uh, with uh, with Unravel uh, to validate uh, to the quality of the job. So uh, even if the user uh, doesn't really, let's say, uh, uh, use uh, uh, Unravel in that particular situation, we leverage Unravel to analyze uh, analyze the job, analyze the previous runs of the job and basically block uh, the promotion of a job if the job doesn't satisfy certain criteria. If the, we, uh, if we uh, consider the job as a not as uh, high quality uh, and thanks to Unravel. So this is to me the value that we can bring. It's, uh, it's a lot of, it's not just uh, uh, you know, bringing some tools and, and just installing them, but uh, build an entire ecosystem integrating with all these tools. I mean, this is just one example, but we have several other examples. I mean, uh, we, have, we have integration with Unravel, as I said, we have integration with all different, we have integration with Airflow and many other components. And you know, the building and the uh, productionization of the pipeline, it's, uh, it's fully automated. Now, what we are working on is uh, uh, all the now that we have uh, we have gone through this experience and and, uh, and we learn a lot about it, um, we are bringing the same let's say user experience to the uh, model productionization. So uh, what we we have done with uh, uh, pipelines, Spark pipelines, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we are going to do it uh, with models. So we want to people we want our users to be able to build and iterate on a machine learning model very fast, being able to productionize them very easily and, 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 uh, and basically replicate the same uh, uh, pattern that we have used for ETL jobs and compute jobs uh, to machine learning as well. So that's, that's our next, uh, uh, next steps um, that we're working on right now. Totally makes sense. In fact, uh, the key point you mentioned, which is you know, the whole self-service portal Right and really making it 
easy for the users to accomplish whatever insights they're trying to extract and really sort of building the guardrails around quality that that's that's really yes. interesting yes um, the self service uh, aspect uh, matthew when you think about your existing users okay, um are there uh, are you fundamentally there in terms of you know satisfying the needs what are some of the gaps that you're seeing that you're working towards um uh, okay i believe that uh, um, you know there there are uh, there are always gaps because you know to some extent i consider our uh, our group uh, um, as as a product company you know within within dbs i mean we are we are building an end to end product uh, which consists of the data platform which consists of all our tools which consists of the ui so uh, that that uh, the users see us as as an internal product um uh, in terms of gaps definitely there are gaps because there are always uh, uh new feature request uh, and new bugs uh, as any any product you guys are a product company you will know better than me that uh, there are always new feature requests coming from customers so we experience uh, we experience the same uh, uh but you know we try to uh we try to um foresee what uh, uh, the user can uh, uh, request so we uh, we know what the user do we analyze the uh, the user uh, the the user pattern uh, the user request so we can uh, we can actually foresee what was going to be like for example one of the work uh, that we are heavily investing on is now streaming uh, traditionally bank has been doing batch processing for years because you know all the legacy system like mainframes like databases now we are we starting to have a source system that can produce uh, uh, real time uh, uh, real time streams so that uh, that doesn't simply change uh, uh, the 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 platform in a way to support uh, uh, streaming data that's that's how was our first step that we introduced like already one more than a year back actually but it it changes the whole paradigm because uh, you just don't want to uh, to uh, build uh, um, supporting stream but you want to be let's say uh, supporting natively meaning that all application can be a streaming application end to end so obviously uh, there are some gaps there where uh, both of our on our side that's what we are developing but both in terms of the applications as well because you know traditionally all the applications are built uh, using batch processing using sql and now uh, the paradigm is kind of 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 shif uh, shifting and in the same way uh, you know this mixes up with uh, with the requirements for machine learning where uh, where uh, we see the deployment of a model as uh, as uh, basically uh, as independent from the serving uh, uh, the serving means so the serve the transport layer so uh, while traditionally uh, because i've seen it many uh, many organization deploying a model was mostly uh, packaging the model into the application and deploying the application as a rest api uh here we say okay let's isolate uh, uh, the model building it's the model artifact itself from the application so basically once a data scientist builds a model he can deploy a model and we're also building a, a uh, all the tools for uh, the discoverability of the models as well uh, but then it's up to the application user uh, to use the model in the uh, in the best way like i can use my model i can deploy my model as a rest api i can embed the model into my application i can deploy the model as a as a as a streaming component or i can deploy the model as a udf inside a spark job actually so this is this is how we facilitate the reusability of the model the the model itself actually so that's that's where uh, that's where we're going and we are we are i must say that throughout these years uh we have invested a lot in uh, in uh, reusability and this has started to uh pay back a lot because we see that uh, a lot of components uh, built by the user are actually starting to be uh, to be to be reused so 
uh, like for example, I can give you an example. Initially, three years back, we started with a, with a, uh, with a very simple UI to allow users to, uh, to key in their SQL. So that would ease the migration of existing like Teradata jobs, Exadata job to, uh, to the data platform. And then as the user became more advanced, they started. They even started asking more features about reusability, about having having a workflow. So the platform evolved uh, with the user, and uh, I think now we are a, we are at a very very good stage. I mean, we have a bunch of tools uh, that are widely used in the bank, and uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, I think we have done a, a, a really good progress. And even when we show. Uh, what we have built outside of DBS. We have been to a uh, few conferences, actually. Uh, I must say that, that uh, uh, we get a lot of good feedback of, of, of what we have built. Yeah, that's, that's great. In fact, I've heard some of your uh, uh, talks. And yes, really, really very, very good stuff. Um, you talked about the cloud migration, right? Um, I think it would be like you know very useful if you can share some some of the challenges that you're facing uh, from a data perspective when you think about the cloud migration. Yeah. So yes. So cloud migration is uh, is uh, uh, I must say that we are at the very early stage of that actually. So uh, right now we are kind of in a uh, uh, exploration phase. Uh, probably the biggest challenge is uh, is uh, um, the uh, access to data. So that goes back to goes back to the discussion of uh, encryption and tokenization. So uh, what uh, uh, what uh, uh, we are working on is uses encryption and tokenization at uh, at a very large large scale. So we do not want to adopt uh, these technologies just for some use cases, but uh, we are adopting this technology uh, throughout the entire data platform. So every data access, uh, whatever data we're talking about, uh, will be controlled by these technologies. So that poses a challenge actually, because, uh, uh, because uh, uh, you know, um, we have to think very well how to uh, to um, to handle it holistically, and uh, you know we have our own ingestion framework. I mean, to some extent, this was uh, uh, to uh, was simplified by the work that we have done previously, uh, because uh, every component uh, that uh, uh, reads or writes data to our platform goes through a, a layer that we have built, which is the our data access layer, uh, which handles all these, uh, um, these details. So for example, all the tokenization, uh, access registry, access validation, authorization, is all handled at this stage of the data access layer. So since everyone is using data access layer, obviously this gives us a, an opportunity to implement a feature across uh, all the users in a, in a, in a very easy way. So that's basically our abstraction layer. Uh, but yeah, I must say that uh, uh, this aspect of security is probably the most challenging aspect, uh, uh, the most challenging aspect where uh, we are uh, we are facing now. And the other aspect, probably that uh, that is uh, that is quite challenging, is uh, uh, the hybrid cloud model, implementing an efficient hybrid cloud model. How how are we going to share uh, the data? Uh, between uh, between on-prem and and cloud, and how we are gonna handle the movement of data because in, especially in the beginning, we do not plan to have everything in the cloud. Uh, part of the data will be in the cloud. Part of the data will be on-prem. So it's not easy to uh, define the rules which determines what uh, uh, what is gonna be on-prem, what is gonna be on the cloud. So here we are evaluating different technologies uh, to 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 uh, for uh, let's say automatically move the data across uh, uh, across uh, data centers basically, uh, such as abstraction layers, uh, abstracting the file system using a caching layer. Uh, so yeah, so I want to say that these are probably the, the 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 two challenges that are facing now. But we are at very very beginning of that actually. So uh, I foresee 
many more challenges on on our path totally agree yes having having done cloud migration uh, you know few times before i can totally um, vouch on the complexity right? yeah um, so changing gears uh, and you know sort of uh, moving more towards your experiences with unravel right um, you earlier mentioned about you know how unravel is helping with the quality and especially this is uh, more in your in the ci cd making sure that the yeah. job are promoted can you share the other ways in which unravel is uh, providing visibility to data operations that are helping you out yeah sure so i think we use unravel in two uh, two main different purposes actually one as i mentioned is the uh, the uh, integration with uh, with CI/CD for all the validation of uh, of uh, of the jobs, and uh, the other is more for uh, um, analyzing and debugging the jobs. I mean, this is not directly using uh, BIAS. Uh, I mean, to some extent, it's using BIAS. Like, for example, uh, we uh, we develop our um, our uh, ingestion framework, our compute framework. So. Uh, we definitely leverage Unravel. Uh, we definitely leverage Unravel uh, while building our our framework. Uh, but I see a lot of uh, uh, usage and I see a lot of potential from our users actually that that uh, they are basically uh, write uh, jobs and they deploy into the platform. So they can use they can leverage Unravel to understand more about. Uh, uh, the 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 quality of the job if they did something wrong etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, it through especially uh, uh, for the type of users that we have yeah I mean most of our users are coming from uh, uh, from ETL background so they have uh, they have been using uh, they have been using RDBMS for decades and uh, and you know when especially when they are given tools like uh, the tools that we have developed which allows them to to write some sql and run it directly on the cluster so for them the user experience is very much like using a a, a teradata studio or an oracle studio but in reality uh, the backend is not uh, is not the same and you have to be careful so uh, one thing uh, where Unravel became really useful is uh, to understand the impact uh, of their queries uh, in uh, on the system. So you know uh, when you it's it's very easy to when you migrate a, a SQL query that have been written for Oracle or Teradata uh, to encounter uh, operations like uh, joining 20, 30 tables actually. And uh, obviously, these these operations are very expensive on a distributed system like Spark, and uh, uh, the user might not uh, necessarily know it. Actually, so this is where we feel Unravel came extremely useful uh, to let this user understand the impacts of the operation that they're doing. So you know, by uh, obviously they needed to get some training, but but by letting them understand. Uh, what's the impact of a shuffling operation and what's the cause of that shuffling operation, uh, they can easily uh, go to Unravel, uh, check, out the, check out their jobs and, 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 uh, and, uh, and fix their job to, to meet certain standards. Then on top of that, we have our own CI-CD integration that prevents them uh, from uh, putting jobs in, in, uh, in putting, uh, let's say, expensive, too, too much expensive job in production. Uh, so the two things together, I think they, they, um, they're very powerful because we empower the user. We, first, we uh, stop the user from, from uh, uh, messing up uh, the platform, actually. And second, we empower the user to debug their own things and analyze their own job uh, by, uh, by knowing. And you have to consider one thing. Even if you could, uh, uh, even if you could, uh, for example, try to get this information out of the uh, Spark uh, UI, uh, sometimes it's not so easy for a novice user to understand it. So what Unravel gives us is the, the possibility for users that have traditionally been RDBMS users to understand more about uh, uh, their jobs and how their job behaves. 
That's super, super helpful, uh, Matthew. I think those are very good insights. Now, when you think about the operational challenges, right, um, I think it would be helpful if you can share, you know, what was it prior to deploying Unravel? Like, what were some of the key operational challenges you were facing? And, um, you know, that really was a starting point for Unravel deployment. Uh, yes, okay. Um, uh, and uh, I want to go back to these two points exactly. Uh, one is uh, the uh, control checks, as I said, that we implemented recently. And we decided to implement this with our new component, the Artifact Lifecycle Manager, because uh, uh, we started seeing too many jobs in the platform uh, with uh, uh, very poor quality. And uh, that obviously uh, has a huge impact on the platform itself. So before introducing this feature, uh, we were seeing the, maybe the platform uh, taking up too many cores uh, or uh, a job being very inefficient. Uh, and that's, that's probably one of the key aspects. But you know, uh, and this is also good because you know, you can, uh, we, we started having Unravel a long time back actually. And uh, you know, we always, uh, uh, we ran training to the users. Uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we teach them how to use Unravel, but that doesn't necessarily mean that then the user, they spend their time uh, understanding the job and going back to Unravel and finding out what the issues are. So, and, and this was the problem that this was not always happening. People were not, uh, uh, were not using it that much uh, because, you know, obviously optimize, optimization is always a hard task, okay? And people don't want to spend time on it because they want to deliver fast. Uh, so these uh, control checks uh, basically I started to push the user to, uh, to go back and, and let's say, do their, their own homework because, before uh, putting job in production. Otherwise, they are not able to put the job in production. So I must say that this, uh, uh, this, was, uh, this increased the, the Unravel usage quite a lot, actually, because uh, if jobs are not optimized and the optimization is, uh, is actually evaluated by Unravel itself, uh, people, users, they cannot put their job in production. So that is probably the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest impact uh, uh, we had. Fantastic. So Matthew, as you look at the space now moving forward, right? Um, you know, what, what, do you, what do you see coming in, uh, in terms of technology evolution? Uh, you know, earlier you mentioned about adoption of, you know, machine learning and AI. Um, yeah. Maybe sort of building something similar uh, can you share, share some thoughts in terms of, you know, how you're thinking about building out the platform for that and potentially extending you know, some of the capabilities you have in that domain as well? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, so, yeah, we, um, okay, we had uh, different debates about how to, you know, uh, how to organize the platform, uh, meaning that, uh, uh, you know, we have built a lot of stuff in-house and now that we are faced with this uh, moving to the cloud the biggest always the biggest question is uh, shall we keep uh, uh, shall we uh, adapt the current stack uh, that uh, uh, that we have uh, and uh, and leverage that so we can be pl cloud provider independent or should be fully uh, rely on the service provided by the, the, the cloud provider, because that obviously gives us a, 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 a huge advantage. Uh, that is a question that, uh, to be honest, I, I don't have a clear answer yet, and, uh, and we're still debating. Uh, I believe that, that, uh, that uh, uh, you can get a lot of benefits uh, uh, on on what the cloud can give you natively, and you know you can basically uh, you can basically make your 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 platform related work uh, much less and focus more on on revenue generating stuff. Um, talking about technology, uh, we are investing a lot in in uh, in Kubernetes actually, 
and uh, uh, most of our uh, workload is on on Spark, and that's where we are planning to go. I mean, now our our entire uh, our entire platform runs on on uh, on Yarn actually on Spark on Yarn, and uh, and uh, and uh, I think as with other companies as well actually we we um, uh, we are investing a lot in experimenting now because it's still very experimental uh, using. Uh, natively uh, Spark on Kubernetes and having having pretty much everything migrated to Kubernetes, and this will simplify the uh, the the integration with uh, with uh, uh, with um, with machine learning jobs as well. I mean, obviously, running machine learning jobs is much easier on Kubernetes because you have uh, uh, you have containers and that's what you need there. So the full integration. So I see, uh, I see this, uh, uh, I see this going forward. Uh, we are exploring our technologies like Kubeflow, for example, for the productionization of, uh, of uh, machine learning pipelines. Now this is like, uh, I mean, uh, this is always in an exploration phase because to some extent is like scrapping a lot of stuff that has been done over the last uh, three years and, and, and pretty much rebuilding it actually because we're using different technologies. And uh, so yes, I see I, I see this path going forward. Uh, it's a journey that will take some time because because I do not expect. Uh, I mean, even the maturity now of uh, uh, Spark on which we rely on 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 on, on Kubernetes, uh, and uh, that uh, that uh, that is is uh, something that is not yet there. Uh, but yeah, that's what we are we are we are we are working on. And I see a lot. Of, I mean, this is a on the side thing. I see a lot of uh, uh, hype also around uh, uh, other uh, other languages as well. I mean, traditionally the the uh, the Hadoop and Spark stack has been all around uh, uh, the JVM, basically rotating around the JVM, Java and Scala. And more recently, I start uh, obviously with the uh, with the advent of machine learning, where obviously we have we have much more Python usage actually. Uh, but uh, I start seeing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, um, work uh, using other uh, languages like GoLang or like Rust, which is picking up a lot recently. So I think there will be a huge uh, uh, a huge change in the entire ecosystem actually. Uh, because also because of the uh, of the limitation that the JVM sometimes has actually, and people are start uh, are start uh, starting to realize that uh, uh, many times simpler is better actually. So going back to to a much smaller executable like like in GoLang or Rust uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, very uh, much simpler uh, garbage collection, no garbage collection. Uh, that that can simplify really well. so I see that going forward totally totally I think there's definitely a revival of the functional programming languages um, you, know, you made an interesting point about a cloud agnostic platform right yeah and one of the things that unravel focuses a lot on is supporting technologies right across on-prem as well as the cloud today for instance we support all the three major cloud providers um, as well as technologies which are, you know, is, if you look at the big data space, the segmentation in terms of different query engines, different NoSQL data stores. When you think about, um, you know, the cloud journey, and one of the aspects we've also added is the migration planner that is, allows you to migrate, to plan for the queries to move and somehow sequence the whole notion of sequencing uh, the data movement. Any thoughts on that, Matthew, in terms of, as you, you mentioned earlier about, you know, in the hybrid world, knowing what data to move in the cloud versus what data to, to keep local. How are you sort yes. of solving that? Yeah, so we are exploring different, uh, uh, different technologies and uh, different patterns, let's say. Uh, and we have some limitations. Some are uh, technical limitation and some are more like... Uh, uh, policy limitations, like uh, uh, to give you an example, um, 
all the data that we encrypt and tokenize, uh, if they're tokenized uh, uh, on-prem uh, and they, be, they need to be moved to the cloud, they actually need to be uh, re-encrypted and re-tokenized with different access keys, okay? So that's, that's one of the things that we, we, we are discussing that makes obviously the uh, data movement uh, uh, harder. Um, we, um, so one thing that we are exploring is having uh, a, uh, let's say a virtualized uh, uh, file system layer uh, across, uh, uh, not just file system, but virtualized cluster uh, across on-prem and in the cloud. Like, uh, for example, to virtualize our file system, currently we're using Aluxio, and, uh, and, and uh, with Aluxio, we are experimenting having a, 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 an Aluxio uh, cluster that spawns across the two data centers, the on-prem and the cloud. Uh, the same, for example, we are doing with, uh, with uh, uh, database technologies, like, for example, uh, we are using, uh, we are heavily using Aerospike and, uh, and uh, we are experimenting the same in Aerospike. So uh, we have to be really careful, obviously, because being across data center and the bandwidth between uh, uh, the on-prem and the cloud is on unlimited. So uh, there, there is, a, uh, there is a, a big impact on that. So that's what we are experimenting with. I'm, I'm not sure if this will be the final solution because we have to face some technical challenges like, for example, retokenization of data. Obviously, retokenization of data and re-encryption of data uh, with this uh, automatic movement is going to be too expensive. Uh, so uh, we are also exploring uh, ingesting uh, the data in... Uh, uh, on-prem and in the cloud, actually, and letting the user decide where the data should be. So, for example, if I decide to ingest some data set, I can decide uh, this data set should flow into the on-prem environment or should flow into the, um, the cloud environment because I know that uh, my application is running in the cloud. So, for example, if I'm ingesting uh, some data that I know that I'm going to need only in the cloud, I'm just gonna just flag it to be in the cloud only and then everything will run in the cloud. So we are experimenting these two, uh, two options. Uh, we haven't come to any conclusion yet because that's, that's, uh, uh, that's in, in the R&D phase now. Uh, but yeah, this gives you an idea of where, where we're working. Super helpful, absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, thank you so much for sharing. So to wrap up, uh, Matthew, in fact, uh, I just wanted to end with, you know, do, do you have any final thoughts uh, on, you know, some of the topics we discussed? Anything that you would like to add, um, you know, add to the discussion? Um, no, not particularly. I just uh, just say that uh, I think for us uh, to summarize over the, of these uh, three years that we have been working on, uh, the uh, the value that uh, we have uh, we have seen and and uh, and uh, this could be useful to other uh, companies as well that uh, traditionally they have been working as a as a service company uh, and uh, and uh, is to uh, to kind of think uh, as your even internal uh, internal project uh, as as products okay. So the way we run the data platform is, is basically like a product company. We have, uh, uh, we have product managers, we have uh, our own roadmap that is decided by us and not by the, uh, the, I mean, the, uh, the users actually. So of course there is an, an, an influence from user request, but, uh, uh, but uh, we, uh, we run the whole product. And this has to be, to, this has turned out to be very successful uh, from two aspects. One aspect is uh, uh, the integration because, you know, building a product, we make sure that every piece is uh, fully integrated with each other and we can give the user a, a unified uh, user experience. And I'm talking all the way from the, uh, let's say, the infrastructure all the way up to the UI. Uh, and the second is it helped a lot uh, uh, with the uh, retention of the engineering team, actually, because uh, 
because you know uh, building a product creates much more engagement uh, than uh, doing random projects actually and these to us has been very uh, very impactful actually i must uh, i must say and uh, the other interesting aspect is uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, there are uh, things that uh, they seem a little bit crazy to do uh, and uh, they seem from a business point of view a little bit a waste of time but sometimes uh, i believe that uh, uh, you know the business might not think about the long term uh, uh, the long term impact of of these things actually and the benefit they could bring and this is something we have done. I mean, I think about all the integrations that we have done, the automation that we have done, and uh, or um, there are multiple aspects. Like for example, uh, the all the work that we have done in automatic extraction of data lineage by uh, basically parsing uh, uh, Spark uh, query plans, uh, which they might seem uh, a waste of effort in the beginning. Uh, especially from a business point of view, but uh, if you look at the longer term perspective, they turn out to be extremely useful because they can automate a lot of work. So the the the, the, the thought that I had is that uh, to that for us, uh, building our platform and our services as a product has been extremely extremely uh, beneficial and it paid back a lot after. Sometime you need to give time to, to 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 for the investment to return. But once you get that stage, uh, you're gonna get uh, uh, you're gonna get your ROI. That that's a phenomenal point, uh, Matthew. Especially the, the treating the platform as a product and really investing and driving it. Um, could, couldn't agree more. I think that's that's really a, a very insightful and and again from your own experience, you've been clearly driving this very successfully. Thank you so much, Matteo. I know we're almost almost at time. Thank you. That was great. Take care, Matteo.